Midday live from the News Hub at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. I'm Stephen Enti. Coming up this afternoon, inter-party resistance against the new voters' register brief the media about crunch meeting ahead of the Electoral Commission's IPAC meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, May 27. On the international front, Hong Kong's leader, Kari Lam, robustly defends controversial national security law planned by China. We have all these stories plus the very latest in sports, entertainment and business coming up over the next hour. Now the Electoral Commission has served notice to political parties and CSOs of another inter-party advisory committee IPAC meeting. And the inter-party uh, resistance against the new voters register has accused the Electoral Commission of political bigotry with its intention to exclude people with voters ID card as part of the primary identification documents uh, required by by an eligible voter to go through the voters registration ahead of the 2020 general elections. At a press briefing this morning, conveyor of the uh, group Bernard Mona says IPRAN will resist every attempt by the Electoral Commission to disenfranchise the over 10 million eligible voters from the strongholds of the opposition parties. Let's uh, quickly uh, get to uh, Komala Kluche, our man who will be joining us uh, pretty shortly on Skype for uh, a conversation on this. This is still midday live from the news hub at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. Komala Kluche will be joining us uh, pretty shortly for a conversation on this. Uh, Komala Kluche attended the press conference for uh, TV3. So Komala, uh, thanks very much uh, for uh, joining us at such a short notice. Uh, tell me what the a uh, press conference really sought to establish this afternoon? Well, the, the details of it is not much different from the position, uh, the main opposition uh, party, the NDC, held uh, in the, their press conferences that they have addressed. Um, I mean, you can imagine that they hold the largest membership of this. However, they have indicated, uh, I print, has indicated that well the EC has been uh, quite from 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 what the chairman said he, he has indicated that the electoral commission has uh, uh, has committed what they describe as political bigotry in its intention or in their intention to exclude uh, people who already hold the voter ID card as a primary identification document required for an eligible uh, voters register. Mind you, this IPRAN group have in the past held a lot of demonstrations, registered their displeasure as to uh, the Electoral Commission's intention to uh, have a new voters register. Now, from what they are saying, the position they hold does not change. In fact, they say that the position is still valid. However, they think that the decision of the Electoral Commission to even exclude uh, people or persons who hold the voter ID card as a primary, uh, so to speak, identification document. It's a means to disenfranchise them. They, they have stated that uh, from their constituents or their strongholds, persons with over 10 million, uh, uh, 10 million eligible voters from their stronghold. Now, they make the point that it's important to recount how the Electoral Commission has unceremoniously switched the position few months after their engagement at the Coconut Grove Hotel with the management of the electoral body together with the eminent advisors where they had falsely stated that they are resolved to use the current voter ID card as a source document for the intended voter registration exercise as captured on slide 247 of the presentation as of December and January 30th. Now, they say that they discussed these things at the... Uh, the meeting, the Electoral Commission never raised any of these issues. Mm. But for them to unilaterally on the blind side of them to, to go to Parliament and then in amending the CI, they'd include it in it. They feel that this is a slap in the face. Now, 
they also make the point that they they would want to continue to serve notice that the electoral commission the nia and the mpp that are still still alive to the collective responsibility to rise in defense of our democracy and they shall do without or let any hindrance from the oppressor who is applying the people's discretionary powers vested in them whimsically and capriciously the state that they will continue to demand from the religious society, moral society, and civil society organizations their timely involvement in preventing an impeding or preventing an impending explosion right. by getting involved to cure the wanton abuse of power, complete disregard for the process of law and order. So Bernard Mona here has been speaking. This is the point that he's been making. Right. But he, he has made it. Mr. Kolosha, I, I want to clarify uh, uh, something with you. I, Bernard Mona, in that statement, did say, uh, if you're hearing me, did say that the well, I plan... Mm. The things that they are going to fiercely resist in getting there. Yeah, so Kamala, I wanted to establish one thing, that when the IPRAN, led by Bernard Mona, say things like, uh, we will resist every attempt by the Electoral Commission to disenfranchise over 10 million eligible voters from strongholds of the opposition, I want to understand how exactly they plan to uh, resist what they call attempts to disenfranchise. I mean, I know that in moments like these, such expressions could be seen as inflammatory especially when there are uh, avenues like going to court available for the group to take so did you get a fair idea of what exactly they mean by resist every attempt well uh, prior to the start of the press conference i asked him that well uh, the ndc has gone to court do you support the 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 reliefs they are seeking in court he didn't pass any comment on it uh Maybe because he didn't want to preempt what he was going to say at the press conference. The press briefing is still ongoing if he has done. One of the things we're going to put to him is that, uh, well, does he believe in the process the NDC has, has used in going to the Supreme Court? If they do, what other means it, does he mean with them saying that they will, they will resist this? Is it that they are going to continue with the street um protests and all that because i mean with all of that we haven't really seen anything much different from it though however it's one of the things that we are going to put to them all right uh Kamala Kluche, thank you very much uh, for your time so uh Kamala Kluche is our man uh, who covered the inter-party resistance against the new voters register who are calling the electric commission accusing the electric commission of political bigotry and they're threatening to resist every attempt by the electoral commission to uh, go ahead to compile a new voters register let's move away from the voters register a new study has actually shown that Ghanaians want political parties to invest heavily in social protection policies. Send Ghana and its partners have been uh, consulting Ghanaians across the country on what they want political party manifestos to focus on. The uh, survey uh, shows citizens want political parties to uh, commit to uh, developmental issues and concerns, including low coverage of social interventions, lack of dedicated sources of funding for uh, social interventions, insufficient transparent and uh, accountability in the delivery of social interventions were also some of the key issues Ghanaians want in the uh, development of political party social protection uh, manifesto. Uh, where Right, uh, well, quickly, I want to get on to uh, Skype right now and uh, engage George Ose Bimpe, the country director of Sent Ghana on the issues. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Mm, so I want to find out from you, uh, I know that this uh, research was conducted by Sent Ghana. Give us a brief, exactly what the key pointers of the outcomes are okay thank you very much um, so so basically um this i mean the pointers are in three directions the first one is about the limited coverage of existing social protection interventions 
The second one is about uh, the issue of sustainable financing of social protection interventions in Ghana. And the last one is about the governance of social protection intervention. If I take the first one, for example, uh, that is the issue of limited coverage of existing social protection intervention. If I take, for example, national health insurance, the citizens were saying that there are some critical illnesses um, that are very expensive for ordinary Ghanaian to uh, you know, manage. For example, forms, all forms of cancer hepatitis, and so on and so forth, and even snake bites. Existing uh, national health insurance uh, package does not cover that. And so citizens are saying that as much as possible, the political parties must demonstrate how they would uh, manage the national health insurance to cover these uh, critical illnesses. If you take the issue of free, uh, social, uh, what called Ghana School Feeding Program, feeding program. The limited coverage is about the fact that not all public uh, schools that are qualified to be under the program are currently on the program. And so while some children are being supported, others are being denied what is supposed to be a right. And basically, they want social protection to be recognized as a, a fundamental human right that uh, the country will have to fulfill. The other, the other one is about... Uh, if you take, for example, LIP, at the moment, LIP is covering uh, 1.6, um, approximately 1.7, um, out of 2.4 extremely poor uh, people. Question is, what happens to the 750,000? That's quite a huge number. And if we want to eliminate extreme poverty, um, you would want to have a situation where all um, all the um, 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 uh, the people who qualify for such an intervention that is targeting extremely poor are mm. covered. So, covered. so basically, that, yeah, uh, that, that basically that is about the coverage. On the issue of financing, you know, the challenge the challenge has been that, and this has been um, a problem for such a long time. The challenge has been that um, funds are not released. On time. Oftentimes, you hear agitations from the National Health Insurance accredited facilities. You hear agitations by cases. You hear agitation by school heads as to the delays in uh, transfer of capitation grants, school feeding payment, and national health insurance and other social protection programs. So, what the citizens are saying is that if social protection represents one single um, um, uh, approach to addressing poverty and inequality, then political parties who are seeking our mandate should demonstrate how they will solve the problem of unsustainable financing of social protection intervention so that we will have dedicated sources mm -hmm. and that is what they would look up for in making their decisions as to who can best right. address um, uh, social protection in Ghana. Right. The other point. Yeah, I, I was going to. Yes. I was going to bring in. I was going to bring in the aspects of uh, capitation grants, release of capitation grants, and the challenges that uh, face the release of these these funds. I, I know that uh, the respondents you sampled raised concerns about this. What I wanted to find out from you was whether they were actually aware of the challenges that actually affect the release of these funds. Yes, um, you know, these are citizens who have their work in school. We also mm -hmm. consulted separately adolescents, adolescent guests to be, to be precise. And these are students who bear witness to uh, the challenges that their school or school, manage, their school management goes, go, go through whenever there is a delay. Because they often hear the, student, the teachers talk about, we don't have talk, we don't have that, we don't have that. Or the parents are sometimes um, require, uh, requested to support whenever these are, uh, I mean, there are delays. So basically, they are very much aware and they are concerned that after so many years of implementing capitation grant, we will, con we will be continuing to have problems of delayed, uh, delays in fund uh, in the release of, uh, you know, disbursement. And that is why they want a clear and concrete commitment and a roadmap as to how 
um, these political parties that are, you know, going to go across the entire breadth and length of this country to canvass for our vote, how they would address right. some of these teething problems. For education for them is the one way that they could easily escape from uh, extreme poverty as they find themselves now. Right. So, so as we go into the elections, I know that it's uh, just about six to seven months into the next general elections. And Sengana have been uh, doing a lot of engagements with uh, people at the grassroots. I want you to tell us, in effect, what are the electorates asking for beyond the social intervention policies, etc.? What else are they asking for? I think that the electorates are basically asking for good governance practices. They are asking for accountable use of public resources. They are, they are, they are, they are asking for a, a seizure in elite and political capture in a way that distorts targeting mechanisms of social accountability, for example. They are asking for greater say in policy uh, formulation. In, 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 in this country, such that um, they don't become fed up with politicians. I mean, in some of the consultations, we hear, te we, we, we hear testimonies about, uh, and I mean, the, the, the skepticism uh, on the part of uh, citizens in terms of how the political parties may or may not address. And we keep on emphasizing, and we have been uh, sensitizing them that this um, exercise you know, uh, that they themselves have um, helped us to conduct, provide the basis or the reference point for holding the political parties accountable. Oftentimes, Stephen, what we know is, 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 is that political parties may sit in their rooms, um, you know, consult some few research documents, and come up with what they think is best for the citizens. What we are doing is a bit different and a far departure from the, 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 the norm, because this time around, the citizens are actually saying the political parties must um, do as they wish, as the citizens wish. And so they kind of are asking for a participatory mechanism that allows them to influence policies and decisions, not um, at the beginning of every process, not when they may not have felt the impact of such programs before they begin to complain. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. George Osei Akoto Bimpe is uh, with Sent Ghana's country director of Sent Ghana. Now, Ghana's COVID-19 case count has risen to 6,964 cases with 2,097 persons recovering from the infection. Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abuaji, disclosed this on Tuesday, May 26. A total of 156 new cases have been recorded in Ghana. And this goes shows the, the, the new trend of showing much fewer cases. Uh, the cases were identified in five out of the 16 regions. Greater Accra contributing about 72 new cases. Western region, 57. Central region, 30, 13 cases. Volta region reported an increase in 10, and Ashanti recording probably the lowest figure ever of four new cases in a day. We will do more about Western region, which is becoming a new hotspot, a phenomenon that we have gotten used to now. So if you go into the full details, you will see that based on all that, the total count, cumulative count, in the country is 6,964 cases out of which 2,097 have recorded, have recovered, and I keep on saying that this is still a tip in the iceberg because as we ramp up testing of those who have recovered, we get a lot more. There are 15 cases who are severe. I'll give you details of where they are. And as Dr. Bedusa Akode said, those who are critical, we don't have anybody who is in the critical position. They don't need any ventilator. We have recorded 32 death so far. For the confirmed cases and treatment outcomes, out of the 15 cases that I say are severe, none is on ventilator, so there's nothing, nobody is critical. We have four at the UGMC, the University of Ghana Medical Center. Ghana East has three. Ho Teaching Hospital has one. Kolebu Teaching Hospital is 
have one in their world, Kumasi 3, Kumasi has Konfanuchi, and Tet Military Hospital has one. We have about 800 people in isolation across the country. About half of that, or more than half of that, are in um, Accra, the uh, Pentecost Convention Center, and the rest are in various centers, isolation centers in Ashanti, and past. some of them are in hotels in the rest of the region being isolated. Right, so the Ashanti Regional Health Directorate has tracked all 48 persons who were on the run after testing positive for COVID-19. The region has so far recorded 1,065 cases with nine deaths. Our correspondent, William Evans Inkum, is joining us on Skype to give us uh, the latest update. Uh, Ms. Inkum, how are you? Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, what can you tell us about the latest figures in the Ashanti region? Right, uh, we lost uh, William Evans' income there, but uh, uh, let's quickly uh, switch over to uh, uh, Eric Yawaje, who yeah, is yeah. standing by uh, with latest update from the Western region. 19 pandemic here in the country. Now, if you listen to or you watch the, this morning's press briefing, you realize that they listed Sekendi Takrade and the Takwa Municipal Assembly as contributing significantly to our case count currently. I have with me the Sekendi Takrade Mayor, Anthony K.K. Sam, for him to tell us how the feeling or how he's receiving this rather um, troubling news. Good afternoon. Welcome to me, the Live on TV3. Good afternoon. It must not be a good, um, but not, you are worried that your case count is now increasing so much so that you've been declared one of the hotspots currently in the country. Of course, I'm worried, and the whole city is uh, worried as well. Because you could see that uh, we started very well when this pandemic uh, came by testing people entering into our metropolis. We did so because we are all aware of our position that as a metropolis, we share border close to Ivory Coast. And you have a seaport, you have airport, and we have numerous ways of people entering by land into our metropolis. So definitely we were worried. That is why we started putting so many measures in place. But, but I know that, um, for instance, like you rightly said, you have screening centers at the entry point and all that, the voluntary testing. So are you, is this to say that these measures are not working? Oh, the measures you put in place, you could remember that uh, some weeks back, His Excellency the President applauded us for our uh, social distancing practicing we put uh, on the ground. And uh, we set up teams going around monitoring uh, throughout uh, 24 hours throughout the day. And uh, naturally, you know, some people will prove difficult. That is where people backtrack, uh, backtracked. And uh, we also look at it that uh, people came, we are approaching fishing season. So people were coming from Ivory Coast by canoe to do fishing here. People were coming from Central Region to do fishing here. And these uh, areas were very difficult for us to control. But with the assistance of the Navy, and the marine police and the rest. We did our best. Any time we get people on the sea, we try to quarantine them and observe them before we allow them to go and do their businesses. But um, at the moment, Second Intercredit Assembly was the first in the country to do self-testing, uh, voluntary testing. Looking at our nature, because you could see that even the people going on the rig, they will come to Second Intercredit before they are uh, airlifted onto the rig. So we thought that our situation was very precarious. So we asked the assembly members uh, to do what we call voluntary testing. So we brought in the health personnel, and all of us were tested from the MCE number one to the last person of the assembly. We all went through this test. And you also agree with me that these days, the result coming shows that most of the uh, sickness is coming from where? the institutions. So naturally, we recorded some uh, positives, and quickly we have to take care of them. We also have to go to the military bases, the Air Force, whatever. So they also started doing their testing, even before the Speaker of Parliament asked uh, our parliamentarians to go. So that is how we have encountered these things.
So are you saying, are you by this suggesting that the, the, your cases are going up because of the fact that you've expanded your testing base? Yes, that is it. Because you know Ghana, for instance, the whole country, the moment we opened up and we started doing the voluntary testing and te uh, what? Uh, tracing, contact tracing and the rest, the numbers started shooting up. So naturally, when we did that, that is where we have gotten to where we are now. Because if you don't do it, how do you know your status and how do you manage it? So we, uh, here, we thought it was very good for us to do such a thing. And by so doing, others have uh, taken after us. So we know we are trying to uh, manage uh, the situation, which is very, very serious. At the moment, we have looked at the uh, hotspot areas like the market circle, the harbor, and the rest. And uh, we just came from uh, MESEC meeting and MESEC. That is... Uh, ECMA and Sigenita Kwade. We have all agreed that on Thursday morning we are going to shut the major markets down. For all one the major week. markets? All the major markets down for one week. And uh, in the absence, uh, during that period, we will make sure to go with the markings of the social distancing. We will go on to do the fumigation of the markets. And we also keep on educating the people on the wearing of nose masks and the rest. And Ketsi local government, we are going to place uh, in the market, uh, poly tanks, which uh, the people will be using when they come to the market. So that's what we are going to do. Notwithstanding that, we have the beer bars and the rest where people are proving difficult. With the assistance of MESEC, we are going around to close all beer bars. Although we have sent them notices, we have pasted notices there. When we go and we meet them in that act, we will let the law work. Also, the children, the children, I think that is all over Ghana. But we took the first step by arresting the children. But the children seem to have gone back to the markets and the street. We are going back again to do the arrest so that if you find any child below 18 lottering or selling in the market, you apply the law. If, if I heard you right, you are saying that majority of your cases are coming from the institutions. So why is it that you want to lock down the market? Because if for anything, it is the institutions that you must turn your attention to. It's the market as well. The market is the number one place we found uh, the positive case. We had it in the market and the ports, the fishing harbors. That is where we had it first. That's why we are taking such changing measures to help us cap down the situation. It is worrying, and like a city, we cannot sit there like that. That is why we are taking these measures. So beyond that, what other specific measures will you want to put in place? Because obviously you have Veronica market at the various markets. People are putting on those markets, but it appears that these measures are not working. What other measures will you want to deploy beyond these? What we want to uh, suggest is that you want to play with all businesses to make sure that their people do compulsory testing. This will bring the issue to bear for us to know how we are faring. And uh, the, what do you call it, the health personnel also, the frontline also, to be protected. And therefore, they will know the cases and we find solutions to them. Thank you very much, Honorable. So that was the uh, um, Municipal Chief Executive for the Second Metropolitan Chief Executive for Secondly, Takrade, Anthony KK Sam, reacting to the fact that now Secondly Takrade is among the hotspots here in the Western region. Thank you for watching. Steve. Let's go back to the Ashanti region where I told you that the uh, Regional Health Directorate has uh, tracked all 48 persons who were on the run after testing positive for COVID-19. The region has so far recorded 1,065 cases with nine deaths. William Evans Nkum is joining us. Uh, Ms. Nkum, we lost you earlier. I wanted to find out uh, what the latest is with this development of tracking all the 49 who, 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 who run. Well, so currently they are all in isolation, but we are not out of woods yet because um, the latest information has suppressed that fear of a possible widening of scope as far as spread of the cases uh, is concerned. But when it comes to um, uh, what, what the health experts call positive or other contact that, that might, or other people that might have come in contact with these 48 people, but not knowing their status, it is also another threat that they will need to address. But what they, they are also saying is that when it comes to information extraction, I think the people have been cooperative, talking about the 48 people, they have been
cooperative. So that is the good news. But they are still, um, I mean, one who says searching for more contact as far as these people are concerned, Steve. Right. So I want to find out whether the Ghana uh, Health Service, the regional directorate, was able to extract from these 48 the reasons why they bolted. Stigma. That was the reason. And um, I think it's something that you've been talking about. Um, a lot of concerns emanating from uh, all, almost all the administrative districts, especially the two um, in areas that have recorded the highest number of cases, talking about Obuasi Municipal and Obuasi East District. Um, and you know, I mean, these areas were, um, I mean, the, the first eight people who were actually on the run came from this, these areas. So stigma, they've told the uh, Ghana Health Service kind of pushed them to mm. go into hiding. Mm. Mm. And so uh, finally, uh, before you go, I want to get a fair idea of the region-wide situation. I know that with the uh, running away of these 48, there were other measures in place. Now the cases have been rising in the region as well. So generally, overall, from people's behaviors and attitudes in the marketplaces to public transport to where we are now. What's the situation in Ashanti region? Well, so, um, Steve, let me just give you the breakdown and then we also tell you what the Ghana Health Service is doing to ensure that at least a certain level of, I mean, they curtail or manage the increasing number of cases, even though currently it is not too significant because per our last count, the last time we had a conversation, we're hovering around 918 cases. Obwasi Municipal had recorded 386. Now, at 1,065, Obwasi Municipal has recorded 389 cases. Obwasi East, which is second on a tracker, the last time at 918, they, they had recorded 206. They, had, they, are, they, are, they are now um, they, they now have 12, 212 cases. Kumasi Metro has jumped from 83 to 114 cases. Ofori Chrome has also jumped from 49 cases at 918 to 64 at 1,065 cases. Now, interestingly, Askori Mampon was just 13, and it was not even on the list of the top five. Now, Askori Mampon is the fifth on the tracker. From 13, Ascori Mampo has now recorded 48 cases. Achuma Kwauma, which was fifth on the tracker, is now seed with, 30, with 37 cases. So uh, at 918, uh, Achuma Kwauma had recorded 30. Now there are 37, so seven more cases have been added. Now, so we, if in terms of the total number of cases, I know I've mentioned that, but let me just repeat, 1,065 Death, we have recorded nine deaths. Recoveries, the second repeat negative. And technically, that is what you would describe as recoveries. 97, the first repeat negative. They are waiting for another test to confirm their status. We are talking about 230. Total admission, 10. And then um, cases in isolation, we also have um, 84. When it comes to female um, population, as far as COVID-19 cases are concerned, we are talking about 557, representing 52%. And the male population, I mean, talking about males that have contracted the disease, we also have 508 in the region, representing 48%. Now, we've also been asking the regional health director whether it is appropriate for the restriction to be eased, but they are saying that modalities will have, be, will have to be set out for the institution. In fact, they will have to come out with their modalities, not even set enough for them, but they will have to come out with their modalities uh, when it comes to management and also ensuring that members and all of that adhere to the social distancing protocol. Then, um, anybody at all, the authority can consider easing that restriction. Otherwise, um, it will not be appropriate for the restrictions or the ban on social gathering to be lifted. Then your first, your earlier question that has to do what the region is doing or the Ghana Health, Health Service is doing. Now, I must say that you've intensified education. For instance, if you look at the cases, I mean, trend as far as the two um, um, hotspots are concerned. I'm talking about Obwasi Municipal and Obwasi um, East District. You could see that there has been a drop of cases, even though they are recording, but it is not as significant. I'm talking about the numbers are not as significant as what we used to see between 19th and 27th April. So it all boils down to the fact that some education is being intensified on the ground for people to really understand the spread of the virus and how they can also protect them, themselves against contracting it, Steve. Right, thank you very much, uh, William.
Evan Zinkum for that update from the Ashanti region. This is still midday live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. We're streaming live on Facebook and on 3news.com. We'll be right back with more news. Please stay. Welcome back. Now, the Africa Education Watch, an education think tank, has asked government to consider using the truck system if schools are reopened. Schools in Ghana were closed on uh, Monday, March 16, 2020, with public events suspended to curb the spread of coronavirus in the country. Africa Education Watch indicates that the proposal to run the truck system in schools will reduce the number of students in school at each time. This uh, is... Uh, in the belief of the association will deal with the potential spread of uh, COVID-19 if schools are reopened. Let's quickly get to, uh, to the executive director of the African Watch, Kofi Asari, who is joining us on Skype now. Uh, uh, I think we lost uh, Ms. Asari. Uh, we'll try to re-establish contact with him so we can continue that conversation. This is Midday Live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. Uh, Kofi Asari is executive director of the Education Watch Africa. And uh, we're trying to see if we can get him to, uh, well, I'm afraid we we'll apologize for that. We'll try and uh, reestablish contact so that we can have that conversation. Remember, Midday Live is streaming on Facebook and on 3news.com. The World Health Organization has suspended testing the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19 patients due to safety concerns. The WHO's Director General Tedros Adhanom uh, Ghebreyesus cited a paper published in The Lancet that showed people taking hydroxychloroquine were at higher risk of death and heart problems. The executive group has implemented a temporary pause of the hydroxychloroquine arm within the solidarity trial while the data, the safety data, is reviewed by the data safety monitoring board. The other arms of the trial are continuing. This concern relates to the use of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in COVID-19. I wish to reiterate that these drugs are accepted as generally safe for use in patients with autoimmune diseases or malaria. WHO will provide further updates as we know more, and we will continue to work night and day for solutions, science, and solidarity. And uh, let's uh, quickly get to other stories while we try to re-establish contact with Mr. Kofi Asari on the education story. But an Ofanko-based landlord shot and killed his tenant and will appear in court today. Victor, Victor Stephen Nanakankam has previously been charged with, provisionally, I beg your pardon, been charged with the murder of 31-year-old Benjamin Ochery over a tenancy dispute. The incident reportedly occurred on Sunday, May 24, at about 1.45 p.m. The police alleged the accused Victor Stephen Nana Kankam has for some time now been harassing the deceased, who is his tenant, demanding that he vacates a room he had rented from him. The police said the two argued over the issue again on the fateful Sunday, with the deceased standing his ground not to vacate the room. Without any further provocation, Victor Stephen Nana Kankam allegedly dashed to his room, came back with a pump action gun and shot the deceased multiple times. The victim was sent unconscious to the Ofanko District Police Station with multiple gunshots. He was later pronounced dead on arrival at the police hospital. The police proceeded to the crime scene at Spot M, where a pool of blood covered the main gate of the deceased rented apartment. Four spent shells were also retrieved from the scene, leading to the arrest of the suspect's murderer, Victor Stephen Nana Kankam. A search in his room found two pump action guns loaded with seven and eight rounds of ammunition each 
and 32 live cartridges. The body of the deceased has meanwhile been deposited at the police hospital morgue pending autopsy. The police say some youth later set the disputed house ablaze in retaliation. Very sad uh, story there. We're hearing that the uh, man, the landlord, has been remanded in police custody following his appearance in court today and charged with a pro provisional charge of murder. This is still midday live from our studios at Adesa Wikanda and Accra. Up next is business. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, 600 workers of Holiday Inn in Accra have alleged that they've not been paid their salaries since April following the coronavirus pandemic. But the General Secretary of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU, Solomon Kote, has assured them the union will resort to legal redress to ensure they're paid. The Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU, has over 160,000 members in the hospitality industry across the country. Holiday Inn is one of the 18 hotels where the union has members. Although 70 of the hotels have agreed to pay their workforce, despite the impact of the coronavirus, management of Holiday Inn has declined to do so, indicating that the business has gone down. It has therefore planned to offer the hotel for sale at the end of the year. The workers numbering 600 have not been paid since April. The ICU says it will adopt all legal means to get the salaries of the workers paid. The General Secretary, Solomon Kote, assured the workers of getting their deal even if the hotel is sold off. 18 of them except one, which is uh, Holiday Inn. He has refused to pay salaries to the workers in the month of April, while the rest have all done MOUs indicating how we are all expecting this pandemic to end and then normal life come back, apart from that employer. And we say this is a good showmanship of employer-employee relationship. Meanwhile, the Industrial Commercial Workers Union, ICU, has turned 60 years, but has come under severe criticism for initiating industrial unrest. But the General Secretary, Solomon Kote, dismissed such accusations. It is only those who are anti-ICU who might be preaching that we are not a violent union. We, we have not destroyed anything. We have not beaten anybody. Only that the union is, is, is filled with leadership that can speak their mind, that can allow the rules of the game to be applied accordingly. He spoke about the need to set up a strike fund and initiatives to foster the growth of the union. COVID-19 has opened our eyes and we are seeing that we don't have anything like unemployment benefits in this country. ICU will be moving swiftly into discussions with employers and especially those in insurance companies to see how such projects you know, can be taken. We've also realized that uh, we don't have a strike fund. You see, those who talk about why is ICU leading workers to go on strike, they should also answer the question, are ICU going on any strike that the workers have been dismissed? All our strikes have been lawful. The union intends to roll out programs to mark its anniversary after the COVID-19. And that's it for the business segment. Up next is Sports with Yao Ofosulabi. Hello, good afternoon. Time to do sports here on Middle Live on TV3. Now to our first story. And Ishmaelado's accolades on the local scene precede him. Now a century of goals for Accra Hearts of Oak, Golden Shoes, record number of goals scored by an individual in the league season, and a trophy laid in Hearts of Oak career. But he didn't get too many chances with the Black Stars. Now I've been finding out uh, how his national team career never quite kicked off. Beyond all the accolades Ado received locally, he could never quite cut it at international level. He finished his career with nine caps to his name and only one goal. A statistic, his loyal fans refused to accord any form of regard. But Ado strongly believes that his chances with the national team were not too many for him to make any significant impact. It's, it's a different coach coming in and we have a different coach back with House of Folk. So it was it was something different. The, so so the, the point is that the playing style did not um, suit your style. Was that the reason why you right. couldn't you couldn't do extremely well with the Black Stars? Yes. Players need coaches to thrive. And beyond that, for strikers, they need a system that inures to their abilities. In Ado's case, 
His time with the national team coincided with an unstable management system, thereby creating difference in styles and general quality. Yes, I, I think I should have. By then, you know, they have they have these big stars. You know, we're talking about like big strikers that back then were playing in the Blasters were exceptional because we have we we can have um, we have all this a handful. Yeah. It's like all these big, big, big names when you know. So I actually I had I had I had my chances. Yeah. And I took it. Ado may have scored so many goals on the local scene, but his nine appearances for the Black Stars is a blunder that can never be corrected. And I think we might get the celebration from Ishmael Ado. When I was still on Odion Igalo and his compatriot and Super Eagles national team captain, that's uh, Ahmed Musa, has been speaking about Odion Igalo and his stay at Manchester United. Yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of people, when he have that transfer, a lot of rumors have been saying that he can do it, but he proved a lot of people. Like, I really, I'm really, really happy for him, for his great performance that he has been doing in, in, in the club. Yeah, Igalo is, is someone that he can, he can score fantastic, uh, fantastic goals that you will never believe. As you can see, one of his, one of his goals that he scored in the uh, Europa Cup, unbelievable goal last, for me. Yeah. yeah. I feel very, very happy and for me, I wish him, I know he can do more better than what he's doing now. I wish him to stay because I would love him to stay to, to achieve more of his dream. As you can see, what he said is, is a dream come true for him. So for me, I feel very, very happy for him and I know he's going to do a very, very good work over there when he continues. Now to basketball, where there could be a delay in inducting Kobe Bryant into the Basketball Hall of Fame due to the coronavirus pandemic, according to the Boston Globe. Now, Bryant was tragically killed in a helicopter crash alongside his 13-year-old daughter and seven other people in January. Now, he was due to be inducted posthumously into the Hall of Fame on August 29, although that date may now need to be pushed back. Well, that's all the sports news this afternoon here on Midday Live on TV3. My name is Yao of Futsulab International News. Is up next. And that's it for the news. Thanks very much for uh, staying with us on behalf of the crew here. Good afternoon. And there is more news at 3news.com.